Hi, everyone, and welcome to this Ask Me Anything session with Natasha Mascarenas. Hope I said that right. Um, it's tongue twister, but this is all part of our 2020 Startup of the Year Summit. My name is John Guidos. I'm the Director of Strategic Operations at Established, the company that powers the Startup of the Year program and this summit. I'm also a managing member of our investment group, Established Ventures. And I'm thrilled to be here today with Natasha. So hi, Natasha. Uh, hi, Natasha. Thank you for being here today. Thank you for having me, John. I'm, I'm calling in from New Jersey, but have my heart in, in San Francisco still. So um, yeah, shout out to everyone on all, both coasts watching. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, good. Well, so during this session, I will be asking some questions to learn a little bit more about Natasha's personal story and her experience in the, uh, as a reporter. And then also I'll be fielding questions live from attendees and viewers. So feel free to drop any questions in the chat window and we will get them over to Natasha to hear some tips, lessons learned, and more. So, and also, if you'd like to join the conversation on Twitter, please use um, the hashtag startup of year, that's startup of year, and hashtag GEW2020. I'm gonna start out by doing a brief intro, and then we'll get into the Q&A session. Perfect. So, yeah. So Natasha is a reporter for TechCrunch. She covers seed and early stage founders, as well as the networks they take to get their first check. Beyond that, she focuses on education amid the COVID-19 pandemic. So uh, during, before TechCrunch, uh, she was with the, at the Boston Globe, the San Francisco Chronicle, and Crunchbase News. And those are some pretty impressive uh, big, na big names in, in news and media. So, uh, and then I also know that she has her own personal newsletter, which is fantastic. And I'll get to that a little bit later. So formally kicking off the Q&A session, hello, Natasha, thanks for being here. And I wanna first ask you, how did you get into reporting? And then more specifically, how did you get into reporting about early stage founders? Yeah, um, so I think I've always been into journalism, which is a boring answer, but when I was younger, I was really into creative writing and my parents essentially were like, you need to do a more professional version of that. Um, and anyone kind of with Indian parents will understand that. And so I picked journalism in like sixth grade and I've stuck with it. I think the thing that's kind of kept me in journalism is um, it just, it's a good excuse to make people listen to you. It's, you have a lot of, you know, responsibility, which I take seriously, but I think that it's like such a special way to like write and be, um, you know, read more than other, other careers. Um, and then tech journalism was, um, I moved to the San Francisco Chronicle, had no interest in writing about startups. Interestingly, moved to San Francisco and no interest in startups. Wow. But um, I got dragged onto a podcast called Startups of the Week because they needed someone to fill the empty chair. Um, and it kind of rolled from there. The co-host um, was my boss, um, was my future boss, and is now my colleague at TechCrunch, Alex Wilhelm. So mm -hmm. it's kind of just, yeah, the moment that startups take you in, and I'm sure you have the same story, John, of the moment you feel what it feels like to be part of and in the world of startups, it's hard to leave. Sure. Yeah, it's interesting to hear how everybody's uh, paths, you know, get to where they are at this point. And I don't think it's ever as planned, really. I'm very, it's, it's surprising to hear when it is exactly as planned. So for myself as well. But um, I want to ask you now, in your reporting of startups and startup founders, is there, are there any characteristics that you find most consistent with the people that you, you talk to, those successful startup entrepreneurs? I do think like the biggest, there's like probably two big things that a founder um, does that makes me interested in talking to them. It's one is being able to clearly distill their vision in a few sentences without jargon or asides or just, you know, falling into a rabbit hole. I am someone who's super verbose. So I get it if you're super excited and just, you know, can go at explaining your vision, but I think there is so much power in um, simplicity when trying to explain someone your product, because I get maybe 300 emails a day can only cover, you know, not that much per week. And so I think it goes a long way when I can really understand what you're doing. Um, you know, just today, sure. I, I ended up not writing about a company because it felt like their vision was too nebulous for it to really even be ready for press coverage. So I think if you're a founder and you're pitching a journalist, if you are unable to explain your company, it might just mean that you're too early. It's not a bad thing, but it might not work for the press at that point. 
Yeah, the, I actually have an, uh, I think a follow up because I see our, our attendees are really filling up here. And I think that a lot of our audience are startup founders, right? So yeah. let me ask you this, if, if those people at some point reach out to you or, you know, get in touch with, uh, well, well, with someone like you, right, at a reporter that reports on startups, what are the most important things that they should include in that, whether it be email or message or, or note to, to someone like you? Yeah, so I think an email and a call are obviously very different things. The email will get you the first yes, but the call can really be the deciding factor between if I'm going to write about you or not. Sure. Um, and so in the first email, which is like usually the first time I talk to talk to a founder, I would really suggest leading with, again, that really clear um, problem you're trying to solve, why your solution is the best one out there. Um, and something about you. Why are you the person that is willing to, you know, dedicate their work-life balance towards solving the problem? Is it because your family was in construction and now you want to build a construction tool to help people like them? Is it um, equity because you had struggles with access to equity in your schools growing up? I think having a compelling reason why you're the one doing it is really important to include in the email. Um, and then I suggest, and it's kind of to your earlier question, John, of like, what kind of characteristic does a successful founder have in my eyes? Um, you know, it's not so much the, their ability to raise, but I think it's their ability to be um, humble about their story and, and talk about competitors and talk about challenges. I think that's also what I really look for um, sure. upon the phone call, maybe not on the email from the get go. Right. Now, the, the subjects or the articles that you write, what's the funnel of that coming in? Do they come through you directly or do they come uh, through TechCrunch or, or bo uh, uh, kind of a, a little bit of both? Or how does that work? Um, what do you mean by that? Just like the kinds of the, the pitches I get, where are they sure. kind of coming from? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that, I mean, there's a mix. I, I have a joke where I don't like being DM'd on LinkedIn because it ends up being a lot of spam anyways sometimes. And right. so I always urge, you know, with most journalists, I think I can speak for them in this case of like, do not pitch a journalist on LinkedIn. <laughs> um, that's just right. a random fact. Majority right. come from, you know, cold emails. And then I think DMs are also a Twitter DMs are a really interesting spot where some good stories live too. Um, I think like there will be founders who reach out to me after we've riffed a couple of times on Twitter about random stories I've written or I've retweeted. And mm -hmm. I think that's a really smart way to, to, you know, build trust and camaraderie and, and also, you know, eventually down the road, reach out to me and ask, you know, are you interested in learning about my other thoughts and other things. Sure. I hope I'm not creating more spam in your, in your inboxes. So that, <laughs> that was not my intent with that question. I promise. Oh, but, no, 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 not at all. No worries. <laughs> right, right. Good. Well, let me ask you this because you and I were chatting before we formally signed on here and I have no idea what the life of a reporter looks like. Um, so give me an idea of what does your average workday look like? Uh, I'd really like to know. Yeah, it's, it's not a cop out answer, but every day is super different. I think the, um, if I had to like pick an average day, it would be, I usually try and get some sort of breaking news out upon my first few hours of the day, whether that's a financing event or a, um, a broader tech news story, um, or like a filing that I found and, and dug up. Um, and then the majority of my day is spent on, on calls and writing longer features. So um, majority of my work right now lives on Extra Crunch, which is TechCrunch's premium subscription product. And that's kind of like where our deeper dives go and our analysis goes. And so those stories, maybe more so sometimes than um, a funding round story, require multiple calls and, and just time. And I think, um, you know, I can write anywhere from you know, five stories a week to 15 stories a week, depending oh, wow. on, um, you know, how busy the news is. And we know how crazy it is now. <laughs> well, I, I give you a lot of credit because I, I love the idea of being a writer, right? Like I've, I, I, I tend to glorify people that I, that I know that are writing, whether it be, a, you know, an author of a novel or something like that. And I, oh, I would really love to do that. I love the lifestyle. It seems so cool. And then I sit down to write something and I, I'm, I'm blank. So <laughs> <laughs> please glorify. I love it. No, it's no, I, it does fun. <laughs> I think it's amazing, but you, you mentioned, you brought up something there uh, in your last, um, comment that I'm, I'm, I, I'm interested in. So you had said, you know, um, a finance filing or something like that. So I guess what sources do you, do you look at um, that maybe some of us, I know you said Twitter and a, a few others, but what, uh, what sorts of sources do you look into when you're, when you're looking to cultivate um, subjects to write about? Yeah, I think um, 
while Twitter is like a really interesting funnel, the biggest source of stories comes from just talking to people um, on a consistent basis. So I would say that I have like maybe four or five people that I try and talk to on a at least bi-weekly basis. Um, and so I think that that is a really important spot to be in with a journalist or and with them too is right. We're both trying to learn about what each other's is thinking is the most interesting thing. And I think sure. a lot of like coffee chats, which we don't get in the pandemic, but can kind of get over phone calls now tend to be really good spots to just talk and, and hear what's up with, um, with startups. And so I think there's like so much power in having a conversation that's not just transactional with founders, um, because that's where stories can start to connect dots. So that's kind of where I think I get a lot of my ideas. Right. So I guess with that, I, I wanted to ask you and you kind of touched on it was, you know, how has COVID affected you as a reporter? Has it made things easier or harder? I have no idea. <laughs> yeah, I think like for some reporters, COVID changed their beats completely. And by beats, I mean, just focuses of writing. Um, for, for me, I think like early stage obviously was was just, I mean, a huge, huge hit in different ways. I mean, like any startup, some surged, some didn't surge and, and, and ended up shutting down. And I think it just got really busy. There was a lot of bad news to report, but there's also a lot of pivots to report. And I think a big, um, you know, a, a large part of my year was just um, trying to humanize the phrase that we kept hearing from so many companies, which is, you know, we're heads down right now, just trying to take it as it comes. Mm -hmm. There were so many different ways we could tell and, and write stories around what, you know, March through now looks like. And so right. it's, I feel like there's been more newsworthy news, probably the busiest tech news cycle we've ever had is, sure. is, is happening still. So we're not over yet. <laughs> right. So I want to ask you too, uh, I guess, kind of given everything that's going on in the world right now, we just finished the election, et cetera. Um, you know, in the, the voluminous amounts of uh, sources that are out there for the consumer, right? So what is the fact-checking pro? Well, do you, I guess, given in, in your scope, you know, do a lot of fact-checking or what does that fact-checking process look like? Yeah, thank you for asking. I don't think I've ever been asked that on one of these chats, uh -oh. <laughs> which is which should be asked, I think, right? Like, I think that fact-checking can be where the public and um, reporters can often just not get each other um, because, you know, some people think back checking as like, can you send me all my quotes that I just said that you're going to include in the story? And no, mm -hmm. I can't do that, but I can share numbers and I can share what you've said on the record. And so when I think about the way I fact check, um, you know, the only time I'll ever come back to someone after I talk to them will not be to it, it could be to clarify what they said if I think they said it ambiguously, but usually it's just numbers um, and growth metrics that I try and fact check. Oh, sure. um, and then I also, I mean, if you make a claim that you are bigger than this competitor, I will reach out to that competitor. I think there's just, um, in terms of like the the heart and quotes of, of stories, I think like journalists just have to take what is given to them on the record and and write. And I think sometimes people get upset that it doesn't sound the way they want it to. But I think our job is just to like, you know, give the correct context, which journalists can be better at. And I think there needs to be, I guess, more empathy on both sides sometimes. Sure, sure. Um, you kind of brought up a good point. I was gonna ask you, you know, how you deal with uncooperative interviewees, but I also wanna know, you know, sometimes the comments can get a little dicey, right? In some of these articles, I, I don't know if you have to deal with that or not, but do you read the comments or, or I, I, I'm just curious to, to know how you would handle some of those things. Yeah. Comments about the story you're saying? Sure. Yeah. I, yeah, I think like I do read them sometimes. They usually aren't like anything I think that are super educated. Like I don't get a lot of educated. <laughs> yeah. Things. Right. I, I think if you're trolling, there's like a certain level of me not listening to you anyways, that I will like you list, read it, but I won't it won't weigh on my heart. Um, but the critique that I do get that I do take seriously are the emails and DMs of people saying, hey, like, just wanted to add this perspective. I think there's a respectful way to kind of come at a journalist, tell them what you think without, you know, being like, well, you made me, you made me not look perfect. Because I don't think it's journalist's job to make a founder look perfect. I think it's to make them look like a founder that's good and has challenges and and wins um and sure. so i yeah I, I think like when it comes to feedback the best way to do so is just messaging a journalist like the way you would um a, an employee or a a friend 
very interesting. So I need to ask you this and I don't want to get too personal, but like in terms of your personal professional goals, right? Like in terms of being a reporter, where, where would you like to go? What's your, what do you envision um, your career as a reporter? Like, what would you like to do? Yeah, I think like, I'm still so early in my career, which is exciting because I don't have to answer those questions yet. <laughs> <laughs> right. But um, if I had to say like what I am hoping to eventually get to, I think like being a columnist seems really exciting and just like having having good takes, having an understanding of something before it's told to me is something I'm consistently trying to do. So I'm just hoping to, I think, be the reporter that tells the story before other people come to it themselves because I think that that is like how I view success is like not necessarily like making founders scared of seeing you know Natasha is calling on their phone I don't want to be that reporter at this stage or ever honestly um but I do want to be the reporter that's like I have to read a Natasha story because this will have something that I haven't thought of yet so I think my goal is just to be a little bit more ambitious in my story ideas and um have you know I think scarier and 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 bigger ideas out there right and so what may i have to and maybe we asked this earlier but like what made you was there was there a person or anything that really made you want to get into this field um you know was it the lifestyle or or what exactly drove you toward to, to this yeah i think like with journalism the reason i I stayed in the field was I I just when when I was working at the globe I was very much just like interested in this idea of um, having this responsibility to tell and elevate certain voices. Um, I remember um, there was the women's march in 2016 and I remember wanting to go and participate and then I remember my professor telling me like the job of a journalist is not to necessarily advocate but it's to go there and report so both sides see you know what is what's going on and I think it's a it's it's kind of changed the idea of like journalists cannot have feelings I think we've grown as an industry that we're allowed to have feelings now but I did I do think the core of like journalism that's interesting to me is like you can be an equalizer between two people who disagree with each other and and, and tell the story and so I think that's kind of what help me really like fall in love with it and I, I have to say like my professor um Mitchell Zuckoff who, who wrote 13 hours he he was kind of a huge reason why I um you know fell in love with journalism because he basically makes you feel like journalism is 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 as noble as it as it is but it, it's like journalism has always been dying and right. um people still do it anyways <laughs> and I think that's important <laughs> Right. I was gonna, that's a good point. So who do you view, who are your best mentors? Like um, who do you work with and, and take uh, tips from? Yeah, I think like, you know, one of my current mentors is Henry Picavet. He is my editor at TechCrunch and he, um, he is great because I think he helps, um, you know, he's not big on Twitter and I think a lot of early stage is, and I think it's really fun to have an editor who's not in the latest Twitter dynamic sometimes and just to be like, what does this mean? And and how can you change that? He's one of the best writers I think I know. And so he is a really good person at helping me fix my language. I'm really interested in that. Sure. Um, and then I also work with just like a lot of great humans. Um, I do a podcast with Danny Crichton and Alex Wilhelm. Alex was my former boss at Crunchbase. Um, and then we both moved to TechCrunch. Um, and and Megan and, and Lucas, I think there's like so many people at TechCrunch that I really am like looking up to as, as colleagues, but also as people that I'm like, you know what you're talking about. And I, um, I want to be like that. <laughs> Right. So I had a question that came in here and we may have touched on it a little bit earlier, but you know, you're currently at the startup of the year summit day three, where we're going to be narrowing it down from the top 100 startups to the top 15 and then five. And then we'll name the startup of the year that will get uh, $20,000 from established ventures. Um, so how might these great companies get into tech crunch and what's the best approach for them? Yeah. So I think like the core of that question too, it can be like, how do you start working with the journalist broadly. Like TechCrunch is is kind of a crazy newsroom of that we don't have formal beats. We are all pretty accessible. And one day I could be writing about space, next day I could be writing about automotives and the next day I could be writing about education. <laughs> and so it's a little bit weird of a publication. I do recommend though that a founder picks a few journalists that they are you know, impressed by 
and and start following them on their social media start following every story they write understand what they value what they bring up high in the piece and and send comments about it either through emails through tweets you don't have to compliment us but i think you can share your perspective and i think i really respect when people are well read and and have something to say and sure. so i think that's kind of the best way to get onto my radar at least as if you're someone who's smart and has something to say start saying it um and, and tag me in it <laughs> right no, that's that's a good point. So let me ask you this. Um, what are your favorite types of stories to, to write or what are the favorite what are your favorite types of companies to cover if there if there are any? Yeah, I think with education, um, it's been a, a big treat to cover it during coronavirus. Um, it's, it's also been easy in a way, right? The whole sector got a spotlight because of schools closing down. And so all of a sudden, like ed tech was a conversation. And if I wanted to, I could write a story about it every single day. Um, but now I think we're getting into a stage that I'm getting a lot of energy writing stories about um, more about the equity side of education. And like we're, we're nine months in. And so I'm, I'm less interested in writing about the need for certain technology and more interested in writing about what's staying and what's sticking. In other words, like I think the 2020 story is kind of done being told and I'm really interested in writing about like what 2030 and 2050 look like. And so any startups that have like kind of like the wildest dreams and and crazy ideas, I'm I'm much more game for it because I think that we're missing that right now. We're missing kind of like the the high reaching too early for for to 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 understand stories sometimes. Sure. Now, let me ask you this. You and I were chatting again uh, before this session, and I know that everybody that's involved here, we have we have a lot of attendees, um, you know, uh, tuning in right now. So and we're all part of this virtual uh, these new virtual events and there's a lot of virtual event platforms that are rolling out. So what do you think of all of this and who do you think is going to um, maybe, you know, come to the top as we are moving into 2021? Yeah, and I'm curious your thoughts on it too, because I think like so many um, platforms are trying to obviously just make it better than Zoom. Um, and Zoom has, has done magic during this time. I think Zoom gets a little bit of an unfair dig. I, I am guilty of that too, of sure. just like Zoom fatigue. And so I think like the way a founder put it is like, it's not about creating a platform that promises spontaneity. It's about creating a platform that creates an environment that allows spontaneity to occur, occur more frequently than a Zoom call, than clicking on someone's name. And so I think the platform that will win this will be someone who can help you feel a little bit more part of an event and experience versus a video call. Um, you know, that said, there are still speakers that can make you feel like you're not in a video call. Like, I don't know if you ever watched Conan O'Brien no, speak, yeah. <laughs> but he can make you, I was, he was at Disrupt and I remember I was just laughing in my, on my, in my desk. And I was just like, how did you make me, how did you make me do that <laughs> from a Zoom call? And so I think that there is, you know, there's a lot of ambition that this category needs to prove and show, but there's also like, you know, the way that people work. And I think that we'll need to figure out um, what, what will be the most sticky. Um, sure. And the, the other thing about that, I think is like, if we do have a more hybrid event space going forward, I do think companies really need to start get ahead of the whole question on who gets to come to an event and who has to dial in because, mm. um, you know, the person who can afford the ticket might not be the person who needs to benefit from the event the most. And so I think the hybrid event could, you know, unintentionally create some divides between attendees that um, I don't think anyone really wants. Sure. No, I, I agree. So I guess taking that a step further, you know, we've been heads down planning this uh, virtual uh, summit for the last couple of weeks, right? And so we've been all working on a new platform and things have gone relatively smoothly. Yeah. Like you said, uh, we were talking before, right? I mean, we didn't have to cancel, which is a good, which is yeah, a very, right? it's a, win. A, a great <laughs> thing. And, you know, the idea of having a platform that kind of, um, you know, keeps everybody in one spot and moving around within that platform is a, definitely a great thing. But I know that there's some uh, people in the gaming space that are, are transitioning and, and working in the virtual event space nowadays. And I think that the, some of those cool little bells and whistles are going to be nice where you can virtually walk around an event and see an exhibitor's booth and talk with a avatar or a cartoon or something like that. Right. And, and giving a little bit more of a virtual reality space instead of just, you know, a platform where you can 
um, navigate and, and stay within the the context of the of the event so um, totally I think that like the startups that make me excited are all using kind of the same word which is spatial technology right. and they're um, doing fun things with voice and I think they're daring to test and work and experiment with the concept of not turning your video on which feels revolutionary right now because I don't know about you but all my calls are now zoom calls um just because and I think that it's right. fun to see people be like okay maybe that's not it right <laughs> and, and maybe it is the the icon or the little human you get to run around in as a video game character during your work day that makes it a huge um, makes a huge difference right and I'm so curious to hear this uh, you know from somebody such as yourself that's in the trenches, right? And you're just consuming so much information on a daily basis about startups and startup founders, right? What industries interest you the most in the near future, maybe in the next six months that are maybe ripe for disruption as people call it or, or whatever the case may be. So what, what industries are, are interesting to you here in the short term? Yeah, um, obviously education is kind of like my my bread and butter there. Like I, I again, I think the surges that we have all seen um, of people just needing something to use is going to stop. And so I'm very interested in seeing how education keeps its momentum, if at all. And if we do see some some um, breaks happening, which I, I think we will. Um, but beyond education, um, I, I am really interested in the future of work and, and remote work space. I'm interested in FinTech because I think it's it, it has, similar to education, it is so rooted in deeply emotional and cultural um, needs of humans. And so I always do care about sectors that really touch a heart versus are built maybe for only someone, you know, a tech worker in San Francisco, which I am, <laughs> but I still think that it's cool to see um, a huge focus of tools that are focused on blue collar workers. And so I think like when I think about the future, I'm, I want to cover the the ones with broader markets. Sure. No, that, that makes a lot of sense. So, and we're getting close to time here. So I wanted to also ask you a little bit about your newsletter. I, I'm a recent subscriber myself. Oh, uh, thank you. And it's, it's natasha.substack.com. Is that right? People yeah, can sign up that way. So maybe tell a little bit of our audience about, um, you know, what you do there and what your passions are and how they can, um, you know, connect with you as well. Yeah, so my newsletter is kind of was just born of me moving to San Francisco and kind of wanting something to write about that wasn't just tech and startups. And in all candidness, like it was to give my mom a reason to read my work. I wanted to convince <laughs> right. people to care about tech that didn't care about it already. And I thought that a newsletter would be a cool way to go about it. So I, the way I format the newsletter is I write about like personal stories that I think are more accessible sometimes than the latest um, funding round. And then I embed that in the middle of the, the newsletter. And then I end with a personal story. Sure. Um, and it's, it's a little chunky, but I think it's, it's fun. And I think it's working well. Like I've, I've, I've gotten um, a good bit of subscribers and, um, I also use it just kind of to plug the work I've been doing. It's, it's been cool to kind of archive it and chronicle it as I go. And I think like, you know, the people tuning in probably don't need to be convinced to care about startup news, but it is always nice to like, talk to each other about things other than the latest tech meme right. um, article. And so I think that's kind of like my big goal there. And it's, it's definitely led to some great conversations with founders um, unintentionally. Sure. Well, fantastic. So I very much appreciate this conversation. We're getting short on time here, as I mentioned. Um, Natasha, I cannot thank you enough. I know I've learned a lot. Awesome. Um, I'm glad. I, I, like I said earlier in the conversation, I glorify writers and reporters. So you're, you know, I wish I could do it myself. I'm not necessarily, you know, being self-critical. I'm not all that great at it, but I give you all a lot of credit and uh, keep up the amazing work. Um, you know, so I want to sign off here and tell all of our audience to thank you for participating to go ahead. We have a lot more sessions today. This is the day three. This is the end of our, uh, our, our journey here. We have the, the last day of the top 100 startups pitching to become champion and startup of the year 2020. Uh, so you can go ahead and, and uh, go over to that channel and, and see those last startup pitches, or you can go and chime in on the ask a PR pro session with Sarah Evans coming up next amongst other fun activities. And also make sure to get out there and get in those hallways and network and meet others as best you can in this virtual environment. Um, this is John and Natasha signing off for now. Thanks again. Enjoy the rest of summit 2020 everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much.